Monica Halen was an eager young journalist when she started to exhibit strange behaviors. I became obsessed with the idea that I had bed bugs. And you know, this was 2009 in New York City. Everyone thought they had bed bugs, so it's not that unusual. Kahalen's symptoms quickly escalated. I also started experiencing one-sided numbness, and that started in my fingers and toes, and that actually scared me enough to go to the doctor. <laughs> Kahalen would eventually spend over a month in the hospital until neurologist Dr. Suhel Nishar diagnosed her with autoimmune encephalitis. He took my parents outside of my hospital room and he said to them, her brain is on fire. He said her brain is under attack by her own body. Kahalen was successfully treated and documented the journey in her best-selling book, Brain on Fire, which was turned into a feature film starring Chloe Grace Moretz. You gotta get me out of here. Now Kahalen has shifted her focus to the treatment of mental illness in the U.S. In her new book, The Great Pretender, Kahalen digs into a landmark 1970 study by Stanford's Dr. David Rosenhan. A group of colleagues and I gained admission to psychiatric hospitals by simulating, by faking a single symptom. He sent eight people undercover into mental institutions, including himself, to secretly test their methods of treatment. The term we use to describe the experience is dehumanized. The controversial study dramatically changed patient care, and Kahalen's new discoveries could change everything again. This is fascinating. Susanna is joining us now. Her new book, it's called The Great Pretender, The Undercover Mission That Changed Our Understanding of Madness. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Let's take it a step at a time. So okay. take me back to the 1970s. What was the goal of putting people in some of these mental institutions, and what was the outcome? So the goal for David Rosenhan and his seven other pseudo patients was basically to see if psychiatry knew what it was doing. If it worked. Mm. Exactly. If they could tell the difference between sanity and insanity. And they also wanted to report back about the institutions themselves. Were these uh, harmful places or were these helpful places? Mm -hmm. And what was the outcome? Because, I mean, it seems like whatever was discovered really changed the course of psychiatry. Absolutely. I mean, the outcome was was pretty damning. I mean, basically, they... they Psychiatrists could not tell the difference between sanity and insanity. That mm. was his conclusion. And the lay, this confirmed a lot of the fears that the lay public had about, you know, mental institutions seen in one floor of the cuckoo's nest. Mm -hmm. So this was like a sword plunged into the heart of psychiatry. So basically. there was a fear that you're essentially kind of locking people up, putting them in a room, not talking to them. And then if anything, they're getting crazier because they're not getting the treatment. But then tell me this then. There's this ninth patient. He wasn't included in this published piece. His name was Harry Lando. So he shared this statement with us. He says, Rosenhan excluded my day Data, perhaps because my experience was so different. He says, I was never depersonalized and staff were both accessible and caring toward patients. Is he trying to say then that perhaps this whole experiment was skewed and maybe it wasn't as bad as we thought? Now, Harry is someone I found during my research, six him. years of research. And when I started to find things didn't quite add up, there was sloppiness, there were inaccuracies. And then I found Harry Lando, who we just read the statement from, and he had a positive experience. I mean, he had a very healing time in his, uh, during his hospitalization, 19 days. Mm. He was misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, like the other pseudo patients, but he actually felt that he was bettered by his experience mm. in the hospital. And this raised a lot of red flags for me and questions questioned a lot of the kind of conclusions of the study, and we're feeling those after effects today. Hmm. So if you discovered all this, it, it seems crazy to me that students in school are still learning about this study yeah. and taking it for, for what it is. Why was there no fact-checking or was there no backup study to, to kind of prove that this is something we should be studying? It's a great question. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's a psych 101 mainstay. Pretty much everyone who takes an intro to psychology class is going to study, is going to learn this. And it's in almost every book about the history of psychiatry. I still think there's a lot of validity in it, even though there are problems. He, he actually identified a lot of true things, but I think we need to really change the way we teach it. So what is the takeaway? We were just talking about mental health today. It runs the gamut, right? You've got people who have mental health issues in suburbs all over the world, all over the country, right? And then you've got people on, frankly, city trains here yeah, in New York City absolutely. who are talking to themselves and it can be a little scary, right? Yeah. So you start talking about mental health. People really want solutions. Absolutely. What's your takeaway? I mean, it's such a complicated issue, but for what I learned is that there's a lot of nuance here. You know, there were horrible places that ha warehoused people. They were not good. Mm -hmm. But maybe there's a more nuanced discussion. Maybe there are places that can be helpful and healing as an ins asylum in that kind of old sense of, of taking care of people. Mm -hmm. You know, and I hope that unveiling this study and revealing the kind of limitations allows us to look back and really assess the past in order to move forward and, and really progress.
Well, we're happy you're okay as well. Thank yeah, you. Thank right. you very much. Thank you, Susanna Kuhalen. And for more on this book, The Great Pretenders, head to thirdhourtoday.com.